Aloha, everybody. Aloha, Pastor Mark. And hi, A big aloha to our friends in Lahaina Baptist, who we said a few minutes ago are meeting for the first time today. So we send out our best to them and all that God is doing there. We are in Daniel chapter 4. And if you'd like to turn there, we will be picking up on this amazing chapter. Part of the reason it's so amazing, and I don't believe there's any other chapter like it for this reason, that this is the only chapter in the entire Bible that is not written by Daniel, this chapter, or anyone else. It is written by a Gentile king named Nebuchadnezzar. The chapter that we're about to read is his testimony in his words, and we will learn much from it because God uses it. But I don't believe there's any other chapter in the Bible that's written by a Gentile pagan king uh, who shares a testimony and here is the testimony let's walk ourselves right through it as we begin this morning to Nebuchadnezzar the king is how it starts this is actually his second dream we've studied his first dream and Daniel was introduced to him through that last week we studied the uh, furnace the flaming furnace and how God intervened there with Shadrach Meshach and Abednego and now as chapter four opens, it says, Nebuchadnezzar the king, him writing these words, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the most high God has worked for me. Now he's giving his testimony so he's acknowledged here at the beginning of the testimony that there is a most high God and all that he's done for him. But you watch his journey as he shares from his own lips. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is everlasting, is an everlasting kingdom and his domain is from generation to generation. I, verse four, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house. Now you get his testimony. Now you get to see what he's going to be referring to. I was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. That's what you do in palaces, you flourish. He was checking it all out and uh, enjoying things. And part of this testimony is gonna sound very familiar, but there's a unique turn in the road ahead. And he says, as I'm flourishing in my palace, all is good. I saw a dream which made me afraid. Does that sound familiar? Remember the last dream he had? He woke up all the satraps and the magistrates and the soothsayers and none could answer or tell about the dream. Finally, Daniel came and clarified the dream and the interpretation. Well, now he's having another one. I saw a dream which made me afraid. And the thoughts on my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. So far as he's giving his testimony, this season of his life, he's very fearful and he's very troubled with what he's seen. Therefore, like before, verse six, I issued a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. So he's doing the same thing that he had done before even though God allowed Daniel to intervene, he tried these magicians and all these people before, he got nowhere with them. But Nebuchadnezzar gives us right here a, a, a peek at who we are so often. I, I turned to God before, God answered my prayers, but next time I'm troubled and fearful, uh, I think, uh, what are my other options? Uh, I, I'm not gonna really bother God with this or not gonna go. There must be someone that can help me with this, and that's what Nebuchadnezzar does. It's almost as he's forgotten this mighty work that God has done in the time of his fear and trembling, and he turns back to worldly solutions. So he says, I issued a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dreams. So here they come, verse seven, then the magicians and the astrologers and the Chaldeans and the soothsayers came in that's a, a big group of people, isn't it? That's what the world makes available, by the way. Where, where are you going to go? Well, you can go uh, get your fortune told. 
or you can go to a soothsayer, or you can go to a variety of the world's people that claim to know so much. And then they came, they came and told, uh, he told them the dream, I told them the dream, but they did not make known to me the interpretation. Now remember that verse right there, because we're gonna circle back with that thought in a little bit. The, you're gonna hear the dream and you're gonna see that this is a pretty easy dream to interpret. Uh, there's no doubt that they knew the interpretation of the dream when you see how obvious it is. But notice here in verse seven, it says the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers that came in, he told them the dream, but they did not make known to me its interpretation. Doesn't say they didn't know it, they just weren't gonna tell him. And you'll see why in a few minutes. So, as a result of that, he gets nowhere once again with all of them. Um, and in verse 8, it says, but at last, Daniel came before me. At last. It should have been at first. But at last, after I go through all the other people's thoughts and interpretations or, or uh, suggestions, Daniel came to me. It's quite often we go, as we mentioned a few moments ago, we go to other people, other help places, chemicals and things that'll make us feel good. And when God says, I've got a solution for you and I can answer it for you. At last, Daniel comes in. It'd be good for us to learn from Nebuchadnezzar and say, you know, my first choice is gonna be God's person or God's word. Growing up, I used to uh, see as a young boy a bus bench and it uh, was a Christian advertisement, but it said, when all else fails, try Jesus. And it used to bug me, bugs me to this day, so much so I knocked down the bus. No, I didn't. <laughs> when all else fails, why wait? Yeah. Try Jesus now, not just try, experience in Jesus. Come to Daniel, come to the right person. That's the idea. But we have a tendency to fall into the same pit over and over again, and say, well, that didn't work, I'll try this. And it worked for my friends, so I'll try this where God has his arms open wide right away. So at last, it's almost like when he came to his senses, Daniel came before me. His name is Belteshazzar. Uh, by the way, Bel uh, is also a Babylonian god. It was actually Nebuchadnezzar's god. He's named after a god, Neb, uh, Nebu, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, so God, false god solutions, aren't solutions at all. Uh, he even named Daniel Belteshazzar um, according to the name of my God. This is, remember, his testimony. <clears throat> but in him, the spirit of the holy God dwells. So I know uh, that I have these Babylonian gods that aren't doing me any good, along with magicians and all these others. But his God is the holy God, and he has the spirit of of the Holy God. He in him is the spirit of the Holy God. So I told Daniel the dream before him saying, Belteshazzar, chief of magicians, his reference, not Daniel's, because I know that the spirit of the Holy God is in you and no secret troubles you, I recognize it's about you, explain to me the visions of my dream that I have seen and its interpretations. Very interesting. He very clearly says there, I don't believe in your God, but I know he's holy. I know you believe in him. I know you have the spirit of the holy God. I'm troubled and fearful like crazy. I know no secret troubles you. So I'm gonna ask you for help. I'm gonna add, turn to you because I can't get this on my own. These were the visions of my head on my bed. He's gonna tell him now what took place. So an audience of one, Daniel, and here's what he tells him. I was looking and behold a tree in the midst of the earth and its height was great. This is what I saw in the dream. A tree in the midst of the earth, its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens and it could be seen to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all 
The beast of the field found shade under it. The birds of the heavens dwelt in its branches and all flesh were fed from it. So a very powerful image of a very healthy, large tree that provided for so many people and so many animals. And then he says in verse 13, I saw in the vision of my head while on my bed, and there was a watcher, a holy one, perhaps an angel, coming down from heaven. He cried aloud and said, thus said, chop down the tree and cut off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beast get out from under it and the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump and its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with dew of heaven and let him gaze with the beast on the earth, on the grass of the earth, let his heart be changed from that of a man. Let him be given the heart of a beast and let seven times pass over him. This decision is by the decree of the watchers and the sentence by the word of the holy ones in order that the living may know. Well, we're actually, we're going to jump into verse 17 in a minute. That dream is described there with careful clarity that if you read the previous dream, you know, as the different metals were described, that Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon, was the gold head. And apparently between that dream, which is just two chapters ago, and this dream, things have gone to Nebuchadnezzar's gold head. And he now is flourishing in his palace and God's going to interrupt, interrupt his kingdom. It switches, as you saw there, from the tree to the person. So it's very obvious that this is not about a tree. It's an illustration uh, in its greatness, but it's about not even just a kingdom or a nation, but it's about a man. It's about one man, and his name is Nebuchadnezzar. And so as uh, it wraps up in verse 16, a period of seven times, seven years will go by and you will see that uh, as we continue, that things change for him. This decision is by, a, by the decree of the watchers and the sentences by the word of the holy ones in order that the living may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he will, any kingdom, any political position is given by God to whomever he will and sets it over it, the lowest of men. This dream, I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Balthazar, Say, declare its interpretation since all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make it known to me this interpretation but you are able for the spirit of the holy God is in you so he acknowledges again he doesn't understand it they won't the magicians won't declare it but Daniel has the spirit of the holy God so there it is there's 18 verses to describe his dream couple things to observe before we look at Daniel's response. King Nebuchadnezzar, even with all that's happened in chapter 2, and the, remember the decree he sent out, everyone must worship the holy God. Those don't work out too well, especially for him. He's not worshiping the holy God. He's as pagan as, as you can be in this dream. His uh, spiritual and magical advisors are of no use to him. But he remembers Daniel. And he calls out to Daniel as a pagan in trouble. This is after he's witnessed God rescuing Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the burning furnace. And his heart is still hard. His heart is still far from God. This great kingdom, um, remember Babylon's uh, mentioned as, uh, what, well, the hanging gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the world that was under Nebuchadnezzar. He has all this greatness and everything, but his heart is 
far from God. And so in this dream comes instruction. Verse 19, I want you to see first Daniel's response, which shows Daniel's heart. You just saw Nebuchadnezzar's heart, hardened, ugly, pagan. Daniel's heart, who's been in the administration now for a while, is shown in verse 19. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for a time, and his thoughts troubled him. He hears the dream, and he is astonished by what he hears. And his, heart's trouble, his heart troubles him because he knows exactly what this means. And he's going to tell it, have to tell it to his now friend. They have a relationship, and he's been highly favored. And before that happens, it says, So the king spoke and said, Belteshazzar, do you do not let the dream or its interpretation trouble you? Interesting, the king realized that whatever it is is bothering Daniel. That's out of Daniel's compassion. He knows what's going to happen to this king. He knows what's ahead for him, and it concerns him and troubles him. So he responds, Belteshazzar answers and said, My Lord, may the dream concern those who hate you and its interpretation concern your enemies. It's a way of saying, I wish I didn't have to say this to you. The other guys didn't want to say this to you. I wish it, it concerned them, not you, but it's you. And here's how he says it. The tree, verse 20, the tree you saw, which grew and became strong, whose height reached to the heavens and which could be seen by all the earth. It's mighty vision, whose leaves were lovely and its fruit abundant, in which was food for all, under which the beast of the fields dwelt and in whose branches the birds of the heaven had their home. It is you, verse 22 says. That dream, that picture, that image, that's you. Mighty and great and providing and people coming to you and animals and kingdoms and all under your authority like this strong king. That's you, O king. It's you, O king, who have grown and become strong like this tree. For your greatness has grown and reaches to the heavens and your dominion to the end of the earth. There's no one greater on this earth as far as kings relate. That's a picture of you. And perhaps at this point, Nebuchadnezzar is nodding, going, that's right. <laughs> that's who I am. I'm the greatest. Dude, like a Cassius Clay moment there, Muhammad Ali moment, right? <laughs> Keep talking. I float like a butterfly and, you know, but in as much. Here's the second part. Verse 23, and inasmuch as the king saw a watcher, I'm going to tell you this part of your dream, a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave its stump and roots in the earth, binding it to be bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let him Raise with the beast of the field till seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king. First part, it's about you. Second part, O king. And this is the decree from the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the king. They shall drive you from men. Your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field, and they shall make you eat grass like oxen. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven and seven times shall pass over you till you know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men and gives it over to whomever he chooses. This is going to happen to you. Your self image has grown out of control. This mighty kingdom that provides so much has gone to your golden head and you think you're higher than God and God has a way of lowering you. And here's how it's going to break down. What once was a great tree is now a stump. 
different thoughts on the iron and bronze. Some think that it protects the stump. Some thinks it retards the growth, as it's being described here. Um, some have different views on it. But basically, it says to us, what you once were, you are no longer, or you will be no longer. And you're going to be reduced to a beast. Interesting, we'll, we'll read ahead here in a moment, but uh, there are some psychological terms. I'm not even going to attempt to tell you what they are. But conditions where people become, uh, in their minds, animals. And they think that they're a beast or whatever issue, and they start acting like that. The condition is, is well known and documented. In the secular accounts of his kingdom, you don't see any decrees or any big decisions for a period in Nebuchadnezzar's um, reign for seven years. In other words, he's not in the role of king where decrees are made. You've seen two or three of them already are made on a regular basis. There's an absence of all of that. And there's a little rewriting of history of somewhere, of course, they're not going to say uh, this actually happened to Nebuchadnezzar. There's outside accounts that shows that it happens. But for this seven-year period of time, this man, as you're going to see, becomes like an animal somewhere within the palace walls so others wouldn't see. And it's just a holding period of time while God does his work. The greatest ruler of that day is now by God's decree reduced to an animal. So find this interesting with me if you do. There's a king, but he's absent for a period of time. And someone else is running the kingdom. And every now and then you'll hear a glimpse of him, but he's nowhere to be seen. It would be nice to think if he's on a beach chair at some beach, <laughs> but nobody knows. And it'd be nice to say, well, the vice king is running things, but nobody knows. And for seven years, this is going on. The kingdom is still there, but the man has been reduced. The great man, the heady man, the golden head man has been reduced to a mumbling, bumbling animal who thinks he is a beast. God has different ways to raise them up, to take them down, to sometimes take them out. I want to remember that as this is September 1st and we move into the next few months. God is in complete control. God issues decrees that are irrevocable. God raises up and takes down. But now watch what this man who was the leader of it all, so to speak. Watch what happens as this continues on. Back up just for a second. The dream's been interpreted. The uh, reminder that the Most High rules at the end of verse 25, rules in the kingdom and gives it over to whomever he chooses. And in as much as they gave the command to leave the stump, Daniel is still talking. Inasmuch as they gave command to leave the stump, the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you. So Daniel, again, notice he's interpreting um, all this time is going to pass by till you know that the most high rules in the kingdom of man and gives it to whomever he chooses. Inasmuch as they gave the command to leave the stump and the roots of the tree, your kingdom will be assured to you. You're going to come to your senses again after you know, excuse me, after you come to know that heaven rules. How's that for a nice bumper sticker? When you come to know that heaven rules and things are going to work out again. Right now, he was so full of self, so full of pride, so full of arrogance, so disobedient to the most high God who has shown him over and over and over again his power through his people. He says, you're going to be a stump. The kingdom will still be there, but you're going to be a stump and a crazy man until you come to the knowledge that heaven rules. I have a good way to show that 
to you, get on your knees and your hands and crawl around for a while. God can do that to any of us. He can do it mentally. He can do it spiritually. Just make us choose a variety or allow us to choose a variety of bad choices. You look at Romans chapter 1 and eventually he says, so God turned them over. You want the immorality? You want all this disgusting stuff? Up Here you go. And you will no longer be able to think like a normal person when that engulfs you. Come back to verse 7, 27 with me. Therefore, O king, as Daniel's describing this dream, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Now, how gracious is this? He asks for interpretation. Daniel gives him the interpretation, but then he's going to give him some advice. Let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous. We have a one word description of that. It's called repent. You stop this crazy sinning, king. Break it off. I like that term. Break off your sins by being righteous. You come to the righteous God, not these pagan demigods. And you break off your sins. Stop doing that by being righteous. And your iniquities, your sins, your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. That should give you a little insight to his lack of mercy, right? This is a guy that threw people into the furnace, plucked other kings' eyes out while their sons watched. This wasn't a merciful guy. So now Daniel goes, hey, take some advice from me. Break off your sins. Become righteous. Your iniquities, get rid of those by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps with that, with that confession and repentance, perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity or an extension of your kingdom. Perhaps God would be gracious and merciful to you if you repent. Has that message changed? No. Our, our uh, issues with America are not political. I mean, they're political problems all around. But they're spiritual. And until we, in a group sense, and a person by person, and family by family sense, in America, repent, then we are in the same situation as this king. And we will eventually be crawling around on hands and feet, and some are already acting like wild animals. Some are already, not just morally, but economically, and every situation that we see, and the simple answer is repent. He's talking to the king of Babylon. So it's appropriate to everyone. And he says, perhaps then God would lengthen your prosperity. Watch how it wraps up here in verse 28. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. The interpretation of what Daniel just said, it all happened. It came upon King Nebuchadnezzar at the end of 12 months. By the way, that means he had 12 months to repent. He had a whole year to say, you know what, Daniel, I was thinking about that. You're right. Can we talk a little more? Could I repent? Could I become merciful? Could I become righteous? Walk me through that. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. It was at the end of the 12 months when he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. The king spoke saying, is this not the great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power? And for the honor of my majesty. By the way, all that belongs to God. And he just took credit for it all. And while the words were still proceeding from the king's mouth. Just in case you think God doesn't hear your prayers or your boasting. While the words were proceeding from the king's mouth. While the word was still in the king's mouth. A voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling place shall be with the beast of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen, and seven times shall pass over you until you know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. I can pick you up right out of your throne and I can deposit you in the oxen corral. Wow, 
Nebuchadnezzar was boasting. That very hour, the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle feathers and his nails like bird claws. I remember in some of the accounts in reading a book once of Howard Hughes's closing days. Some I won't comment on because it was disgusting, but when I think those claws and the long hair he lost his mind at this point. He actually believed he was an oxen. There's a homeless gentleman that I've tried to make contact with over the past couple of years, and I've gotten really slow with this, and he's extremely dirty. He's not in our community. And he carries um, plastic uh, Ralph's bags, all his belongings, whatever they are, there are these bags, about 30 of them. and. Sometimes I just see a pile of bags. Like, okay, I think he's there. And then I go down by the railroad track and I waved to him, I said hi, he just kind of growls at me. <laughs> but Friday, I'm at a turn signal and I, I see him behind some bushes. I'm making a left and there's a little parking spot right there and I was in the truck and I said, you know, I'm talking to God as the light's changing. I go, it says, the time is up, I'm by myself, I'm safe. So I pull over and uh, I left the truck running for a quick getaway. <laughs> and uh, he was kind of in the bushes, and I, I walked over the corner of my truck, maybe, maybe got as close as Tom and I are. And I said, hey, I said, it was pretty hot. And I said, I'm going to the store. Can I bring you some water, some food? And he started mumbling Jesus talk. He goes, oh, Jesus, I can't, not, not coherent, but, you know, Jesus Christ takes care of me or something. And I go interested. I took another step forward. I said, oh, okay. I said, are you okay? Do you need, it's a little hot out. Do you need a, a drink? And he, uh, he said it a little more. And then it hit me. I'm a little slow, remember, but it hit me. I'm a pastor. He's talking about Jesus. I said, okay, my name's Pastor Mark. If you need any, and his countenance changed. And he said, you're a pastor? And I said, yeah. And he said, have we met before? He started talking a little more fluid. And I said, well, we, <laughs> we hadn't really met. You growled at me once. I know I didn't tell him that. I said, we've talked. And he said, oh, and uh, I said, I'm a pastor in Orange County and told him a little about our church, but I, I'm just here to see if you need anything. No, God's taking care of me. Thank you. And so we had a few more exchanges and I said, well, let me know. I, I see it from time to time. And, uh, and as I got in the truck, he, I think there were some Bible verses. He quoted a few more things, but he was friendly. I had a breakthrough. And I'm not out to, you know, make this a success story and say, I'm going to bring him in a three-piece suit. Uh, actually, be more of a miracle if I was in a three-piece suit, right? And you know God was at work then. But for me, it was something that I've been praying about and just watching, and, and there's the opportunity. But he's not there mentally. And, and he, he's, um, and I say this out of all kindness, he's very dirty. That's why people don't approach him. I saw him in Ralph's once, and I could smell him from three aisles over not being funny. Is that bad? And I think then, here's my reasoning behind it. Every person has a story, we know that. But what takes a person from whatever his life was to the mental capacity, even though I think God's doing something spiritually there. I think if you would have been on a palace tour during this time, and they said, don't look out these windows right now, and you looked out those windows, that's what you would see. The man's name is Mitchell, by the way, if you don't mind praying for him. You would see a Mitchell out of sorts. For seven years, this went on. Fingernails like bird claws. Eagle feathers like hair it would look like. Here's how it wraps up. Amazing. Even in that condition, and this is why we don't give up on people. At the end of the time, those seven years, I, Nebuchadnezzar, him still telling the story, lifted my eyes to heaven. It took seven years. Lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me. I was out of understanding. I was not making sense. Nothing was clear. I did not understand. 
suddenly my understanding returns to me. And I was blessed, uh, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. You can't do that if your understanding is absent. But his understanding comes back to him. And the Spirit of God starts working in this mentally ill man and says, this is the Most High. There is only one true God. Now, still very capable of sinning and falling, but his understanding returns and he blesses the Most High and praises and honors him forever. And this is how it sounded. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven what he learned by the way and among the inhabitants of the earth no one can restrain his hand or say to him what have you done no one can speak to God that way what have you done at the same time first his understanding comes back look at this beautiful sentence at the same time my reason returned to me you ever talk to people who are unreasonable the touch of the hand of God, reason returns to people. And for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor, uh, and for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. My counselors and nobles resorted to me. I was restored to my kingdom and excellent majesty was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol the honor of the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth, and his ways are justice. Those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. That's the bumper sticker on his chariot. Those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. And God took a man who was full of himself, stripped him down to an animal, thinking he was, and then restored him even to his kingdom. So he can restore mentally ill. He can restore marriages. He can restore physical ailment. He can restore anything because he's able to do all. It's up to him. But Nebuchadnezzar's testimony becomes just that. Those who walk in pride, he is able to restore. I think God chose Daniel chapter 4 as a chapter to say, watch this pagan king's testimony and don't you fall into the traps that he echoes because we all can. I've been a Christian a long time. It can become pride real easy, can it? I would never do that. Pride. And God has a way of taking us down to the humbling point where we need to be. We'll continue because this fourth chapter leads us into the remaining part of the book, which has all kinds of prophetic announcements and stories for us. It ties well into Revelation future events. But before you can go there, I think God's place is right in order to say, make sure your heart's ready. I read this chapter and studied for this chapter and had to repent. I just found myself saying, God, I want to do some business with you. I want you to point out anything in my life that doesn't, uh, that shouldn't be elevating and you bring me to that place. This kind of stuff scares me. The pastor doesn't think he's going to turn into an oxen. But what I do know is that God can do whatever he wants with anything that's wrong in our hearts or thoughts or anything. And yet he gives us warning to repent. I want to close our time just like we open with communion. Just to say, God, here's my heart. Melt it, mold it. I humble myself before you. Let's pray silently as you make your own application. has told you, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you. He has told you, O oh man, what is good and 
what the Lord requires of you to live justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. He has told you, oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you. He has told you, oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you to live justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with our